Welcome to this session of poster presentations. Um, my name is Caroline Krüger, and um, the session today is all in English. Um, there's no interpretation, unfortunately, available. And um, I would like to welcome especially our grantees, um, Sebastian Betke, Madeleine Gambino, and uh, Anastasia Sedova. Um, <clears throat> who will present the, uh, their projects today. And uh, originally, Paul Post was uh, the chair of this session. Um, since he is not well today, I am taking over and um, I will do my best to um, substitute for him. But it's the first time for me moderating as well. So um, keep that in mind. Um, also, unfortunately, Molly Miller won't be here today. Um, since um, in her location there is a massive um, winter storm and she has no network connection. We are very so sad about this. As we are on the topic of things that are not um, going as originally planned, um, we would have liked to have a poster exhibition in Hanover um, um, that would have been available um, for the whole duration of the symposium. But um, I think we can also now see the advantages, advantages of the digital space as we now have a digital um, exhibition of posters, of booklets, and um, <clears throat> also some articles that you can download. Um, so I think this is a good alternative. And also today we can um, have a talk together about um, research projects of our young talents. Now I would like to um, give the word to our grantees. Um, please introduce yourself first with a couple of words on where you're from and what um, yeah, started off your um, projects or your research and then um, go ahead with your presentation. And I think we start with uh, Sebastian Bethke. I'm a freelancer in conservation field, uh, cultural heritage on many sides. Uh, I start as a practitioner, like a craftsman. I'm a carpenter and masoner, and was working over 15 years in this field of traditional craftsmanship. Uh, later on, I, um, until now, I'm occupied with cultural heritage management and expertises and research of monuments. Um, my focus lying on fortified churches uh, in southern Transylvania. Now I want to presenting shortly um, a new project um, which has a long prehistory, but um, uh, it's a fortified church of Uphold um, and uh, this con participative reuse concept what we would like to implementing in the next years. Uh, Shortly, let's see if I can move. Okay. Um, who we are, we are a very local uh, association who called Casa Apolt. It was founded 2008, partly from villagers, uh, mostly from outsiders. Um, and um, we took over the fortified church uh, ensemble and the parish house, and we was working in the region um, as a, um, expertises for preserving cultural heritage. Uh, we organizing crafts courses, architecture summer schools, training programs for villagers, and of course, culture events uh, for open uh, culture heritage or to make it better accessible. Apolt, it's um, well, a very small village, 800 people living in this village. Uh, it's close to Sigishora. Right up, you see, um, it's quite in the middle of Romania. Um, and uh, it's 15 kilometers from Sigishara, who is uh, UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's a medieval town. And the whole region, uh, down you see Sibiu, it's maybe known. Um, it's called the Saxon uh, Triangle. Um, here was settled down in the 12th century a colonist from Germany, uh, from Luxembourg, and from Holland, uh, Netherlands, um, and uh, colon colonizing this region and building up um, 
towns and villages and was a kind of minority in the Hungarian kingdom. Um, they are famous, the Saxon, the, Sex, the Transylvanian Saxons, uh, they are famous for, for building up uh, own defending system against the uh, Osmanic Empire in the um, 15th century. So it's called fortified churches. In the Hui region, we have uh, around 160 fortified churches left from probably 300. Uh, Upward, it's one of the biggest, um, has, you, as you see in the middle, it's always a church. Then you have uh, the first ring wall, um, second ring wall here, and on each ring wall, you have the defending buildings. The fortified church was supposed to be also the refuge, refugee for the refuge for the whole village. So they can enter there, closing up and um, defending themselves. Um, step by step, each building become also a, a village function. So we have a priest tower, who is called now White Tower. You see from the name, the Oats Tower, there was a small mill inside. So it was like a small town himself in the function beside the defending and storing of proviant was changing from time to time. There are some views from the church now. Um, the, the Saxon um, emigrated in the 20th century on different waves to Germany. The last wave was in the after the revolution in the 1990s. So in the whole region and also in Uphold, you have um, a small evangelic or a Protestant community. Uh, we have 20 people who are celebrating one time per month a church service um, uh, inside. Um, we as an association took over the whole place. So we we maintaining this place, restoring it and um, can using this place. At the moment we do it um, using temporarily and um, step by step uh, we get into into it that we want to make a really a good concept for the whole place. Uh, so we start to brainstorming uh, among our association and friends and um, and we analyzing the last past 10, 15 years and uh, what we would like to do. And um, we were finding out that we're working actually in this field of research, documentation, education, training and art and culture. So um important was for us all because we are local association so really um community uh, we would like also to linking our uh, concept to to the local community and stakeholders so that we support each other and serving also the needs of the community um the first thing what we would like to do is um to set up um three components or three institutions this is um, what we did actually in the last 10, 15 years, but now we would like to put it on a, on a stable base. Uh, we have um, Transylvanian Crafts and Restoration School, um, Fortified Church Research and Documentation Center, and an Upward Culture Heritage Center. Um, so we want to dedicate uh, part of the ensemble as uh, be used by this kind of institution. But we don't want to limit it to this, and we let uh, also um, space or the, um, a buildings free where we don't have um, concept and we don't want to deciding this concept alone. So we want to make a participative approach. Um, want to make a dialogue with the villagers and with the evangelical community uh, and with professionists how we can use um, the whole site that it's function for 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 us but also for for the community so we have we, we make a kind of sketches um, where we can just visualizing uh, the places um, uh, we are in a concept father and wants to starting then the planning father in the next year or in this year and the next years the church building it's a special building uh, we start also to think a little bit about we are in a dialogue with a local priest who allowed us uh, to think about um, and we have to see, you have to know that we are uh, this is a, a very traditional church protestant church um, a conservative church so uh, it was always a minority and um, to reusing the church in a village and especially in medieval church it's 
even not easy. And um, it's not a question that we um, changing completely the function. It will be always a religious place. But um, it's clear that this uh, small community not can maintaining all the place. And even for us, it's very difficult to, to, to take care of the place uh, without any function. So we try to find um, a practical solution that we can use it for our aim, but also for the public, uh, but what also has a benefit for maintaining the buildings. Um, just one example, it's a um, gatehouse who uh, you see on the left side how we found it uh, actually in 2004, and then it's changing step by step with this restoration projects. And um, this gatehouse, it's a good example that the function ch was changing comp always. Uh, in the community, but always serving the community. So it was, on the beginning, it was a medieval tower, a defending tower, later was a town hall inside, uh, the first town hall in the village. Uh, it was an, um, a museum and a brass band um, exercise room. Uh, we was using it as an organ workshop to, uh, to restore the organ, and later, um, now it's actually a multifunctional room for seminars and uh, for meeting a meeting point. Uh, we always looking also on the free space. Um, you see that um, surrounding the whole fortified churches and uh, about around the parish house, we have a huge uh, space, green space, who is at the moment quite wild. Um, the, the concept of landscaping, um, it's always a little bit falling under the table. So we want to uh, put it at, at the same level as the architecture or as a conservation uh, of the buildings. And uh, Victoria Luft, it's a colleague of me, uh, helped me here also to, to work on this concept. Uh, the parish house, it's a new building from 19th century. Um, um, we want to use it as a guest house. Um, it's uh, much easier to to reusing it uh, as a medieval fortified church or a tower. Um, last but not least, um, we was inspirating by our concept from this upward, upward heritage lab. Um, this is um, a study project uh, from the European University Viadrina of Frankfurt Oder, uh, where I am at the moment, uh, I'm a student, I'm studying it, um, and uh, I study um, a master program for strategies for European heritage, culture heritage. And in, in this master study, uh, it's a study project, this Upward Heritage Lab. It's a summer school who um, implementing um, for another university from Romania and from Germany. Uh, and we want to um, um, get a deeper look on on the church because we want to know exactly uh, how it's um, historic fabric, how it's the value of uh, the art of the church. So um, we have mural paintings uh, inside the church and the idea is to to discover them, also they are discovered, but to, to make a research on them, um, but also historical crafts technique we would like to um, uh, um, show and, and, and demonstrating and on the end should be come out um, a conservation concept for this for this church, but also for the whole region. So um, we hope um, that um, also we had to, to postpone this summer school from last year to this year, but um, at the moment looks good that we can uh, have this year the summer school. Um, so last but not least, um, the idea of our concept is that we uh, going on three major points. It's interdisciplinary um, work. We would like to approach this in dialogue with, uh, with the locals and the regional people, stakeholders. And uh, on the end, we would like to do it also in a kind of process. So we, it's, it's a long process. Um, it's probably one of the first one, but um, so we have to be care that um, uh, everybody is he here, heard and um, uh, and um, we can find a nice play, a nice open space for this uh, part. Um, what we need for the next step is, um, of course, we need a networking with all people who are interested or are in, in other fields and other places in Europe. 
um, researchers, professionalists, and of course we need funding opportunities. Um, um, we, this is uh, without money, of course, nothing working. But um, we're looking for a good uh, collaboration with um, other people. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, as um, yeah, I would like to um, swiftly uh, hand over um, to um, Madeleine Gambino. Can everyone see my screen? It's working well. Great. Um, yes, hi. So my name is Madeline Gambino, and I'm joining you all from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, um, in the Eastern United States. So I'm grateful for the opportunity to share a non-European perspective um, and to join the conversation. I'm a PhD candidate at Princeton University in the religion department, so from a religious studies perspective. Um, and this is part of my dissertation research on um, Catholic change and decline in Philadelphia and how um, parishioners in the archdiocese respond to changes like um, declining membership, aging membership, um, and financial insecurity. The Roman Catholic Archdiocese of Philadelphia closed about 130 parishes in the city and its surrounding suburbs between 1950 and 2019. So on the left hand of the screen here, you can see a map that I've made of these parish closures. And um, most of those are within the city boundaries, which you can see in red um, with a couple in the suburbs. 62 of those, 100, of, uh, 62 of those 130 parish closures, um, or about 50%, um, took place in the last decade alone, um, since 2010. Not all of these parish closures have been opportunities for church reuse. Um, many cases leave these churches in the care of the parishes um, into which they've been merged, um, so as auxiliary worship sites um, alongside um, what becomes the, the dominant parish church. The act of relegation, which deconsecrates a Catholic church and allows for its demolition or its sale for adaptive reuse, is meant to be an exceptional act in Catholicism. Nonetheless, the Archdiocese of Philadelphia relegated 35 churches between 2012 and 2020. So I'll present some very brief comments on two of these cases um, in the hopes of generating some discussion about parish responses to this process. First case here is St. Laurentius, which was a late 19th century church of a Polish national parish. After the parish um, community largely suburbanized in the post-war era, uh, the parish was depleted. The archdiocese consolidated St. Laurentius into a neighboring parish in 2013. Um, and you can actually see in the bottom left um, down here, the parish church um, into which it consolidated. So really just um, a couple of blocks away. Some of the former St. Laurentius parishioners took issue with the sale of their church building um, to a residential developer, which would provide some financial relief to the parish into which they had merged. So in other words, selling St. Laurentius Church um, in order to help pay for repairs for, um, for this church over here. For six years, these former parishioners collaborated with preservationists, the local government, and non-Catholic neighbors to use city policies of historic preservation to slow these reuse plans. And in particular, some of them wanted um, just the exterior of the building to be saved, um, these towers here to be saved. Um, other parishioners wanted the interior of the church to be saved as well. Um, uh, and so there was sort of uh, an ongoing conversation about um, how to best use this church. Should it go to a residential developer or um, would it be better served um, as, as some sort of community space? Ultimately, this group failed to achieve all of these goals. Um, it still went to a residential developer, but they did alter the reuse plans to better serve the neighborhood. Because Fishtown, which is the name of the neighborhood here in Philadelphia, because it's rapidly gentrifying, they demanded fewer units, more parking, and a commitment to the historic preservation of the building's exterior. The second example is St. Peter Claver, which was established in 1886 as the first parish for Black Catholics in the Archdiocese. It's located um, just south of Center City, um, Philadelphia. A century later in 1985, the Archdiocese closed St. Peter Claver along with um, some other Black parishes in the city, arguing that urban demographic change had necessitated these closures. In turn, parishioners protested that these closures took away much needed resources, including Catholic schools um, in the city. 
35 years later, when the archdiocese tried to relegate St. Peter Claver in 2019 with an eye towards selling the highly valued property, former parishioners again protested vehemently. And remember, this is 35 years after the parish was supposedly dissolved, it had ceased to exist. But remarkably, these former parishioners were able to overturn the archdiocese's relegation of the building to profane use and to keep it as a sacred Catholic space. And they were able to do so, I argue, because they leveraged the powerful history of Black Catholicism in the city, um, and also because they submitted a proposal for the building's mixed reuse as a shrine and as a space for interfaith and interracial dialogue. Nonetheless, um, in the last 18 months, the archdiocese has failed to allow the parishioners to move forward with their plan. And this is despite the fact that the parishioners said in the plan that they had raised the money to, um, to, to do repairs to the building, mostly on the roof, um, that were needed. They didn't need the, the archdiocese's um, support for that. But the archdiocese sort of won't let them in the door. Um, the community believes the archdiocese is waiting for the aging church to be beyond repair um, so that it can, after all, sell the property. So I raise these brief examples um, to gesture to two concerns of mine in the general discussion of church reuse. First, as a researcher in religious studies, I want to emphasize that religious communities continue to exist even when they're officially dissolved by the archdiocese or when their properties are sold. We often mention consensus building or parish involvement and in planning, um, but I argue that the experience of and fear of potential church reuse is more and more a shared experience and thus deserve significant study as a critical component of contemporary lived religion. And lastly, these cases reveal much longer racial, ethnic, and economic histories. Where have religious communities faced demographic and financial insecurity? Which historic properties become available for reuse and why and through what processes? Philadelphia's Catholic Church supported um, white Catholic suburbanization at the dis disinvestment of these urban parishes in the post-war era. So in short, at the same time that many American cities deindustrialized and disinvested in urban center centers, like in Philadelphia, so did the Catholic Church, um, reinforcing common racialized narratives about so-called urban decay. The Archdiocese also contributes to today's gentrification, selling historic properties in attractive neighborhoods like Center City and Fishtown, and in both eras, these decisions have been justified as good financial sense. But it's important to see that the effect has been the closure and relegation of former Eastern and Southern European immigrant communities or of African American communities. And this in turn leaves um, and preserves um, what's long been seen as sort of the default Catholic history, which is the Irish um, heritage. And so that is, is what ends up remaining in the Catholic built environment when the, these other communities um, close and then lose their buildings. So to conclude, these large scale programs of church um, closure and reuse have significant effects on whose history is preserved, who has access to Catholic spaces and services or religious spaces and services, and what the church will look like moving forward. And these are questions to examine when we consider church reuse broadly, um, but also the fate of specific properties. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we now move on to the project of Anastasia Sedova. Um, yeah, please start uh, sharing your screen. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Anastasia Sedova, and currently I'm an assistant professor uh, in Zhevsk State Technical University, which is in Russia. And I would like to introduce you to my PhD research, which I uh, discussed recently in Politecnico di Milano in Italy. And it's called uh, Spaces out of religious use and ecclesiastic architecture as marketable real estate assets. Uh, and um, first of all, uh, as you might know, um, many Orthodox churches are in Russia are currently rooting away. So, and on this slide, you can see some examples of such churches. And as you can understand from the pictures, uh, the majority of them are located in hamlets or in decaying villages. So I can say in the middle of nowhere. And the main question of the research is, um, how to create the adaptation scenario for such churches and uh, how to understand what to do with them. Uh, so on the first step, the process of adaptation was explained in terms of how and what stage of church life cycle uh, 
um, the decision of adaptation can be taken. After, based on the study of, of uh, types of values and forms of obsolescence typical for such churches, uh, the research studies uh, the presence of different pre-adaptation uh, forms of obsolescence typical also for such churches. Uh, the next question was uh, what use interventions can potentially be applied to heritage uh, with such obsolescence? The next one, uh, what added value can be created after the adaptation apply and reuse interventions? Uh, and the last one, what impact can be generated once the adaptation is performed? Um, on the next step of the research, the stakeholders were studied. Um, so based on the study of best practices in, in cultural heritage adaptation, the thesis introduces potential stakeholders for the adaptation of Orthodox churches in Russia. And um, the existing distribution of stakeholders into four groups, namely institutional stakeholders, key, marginal and operative stakeholders, you can see on the left in the last part of the slide, uh, while the thesis proposed uh, the shift from the existing distribution to all the stakeholders to the planet one. So it proposed, uh, the thesis proposed to reorganize the, um, the distribution of the stakeholders. And you can see that in the existing scheme, uh, only two stakeholders are considered uh, key as, as key stakeholders, while we suggest to consider four stakeholders as key stakeholders. Um, on the next step, uh, the thesis contextualizes the, con the concept of partnership agreements and explains that the combination of funding mechanisms play an important role in encouraging the flow of private investment funds towards uh, the church's adaptation projects. Financial tools combined within integrated area-based strategies uh, can produce considerable synergy to create added value, which is, um, I think, the most important aspect here. Uh, and financial tools and funding mechanisms are explained according to their division into uh, public funds and incentives, private funds and communitarian funds. While the governance strategies, which entail the combination of uh, mentioned before uh, funding mechanism, uh, sorry, income streams, uh, can be divided into seven led, lease and partnerships. So such partnerships are considered the most um, successful experiences and they were uh, also explained more more in detail uh, on the next step of the thesis um, the research proposes uh, the division of multi-stakeholder partnerships um, into three groups so the first is the public-led partnership the second is uh, the denomination-led partnership and the last one the private-led partnership so um, these partnerships were the contribution to the literature made by the thesis. They were explained first. And on the last step of the thesis, um, so the thesis concludes uh, with a proposal for the decision support system, which, uh, so this question was raised at the beginning of the research. And uh, this decision support system allows the identification of preliminary general options for the adaptation of former church buildings. The, the system uh, includes every possible variant of cluster divisions of case studies, totaling 71 scenario of former Orthodox churches. And uh, this decision support system is considered as a first step in the adaptation of uh, Russian religious patrimony. So I think I should stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for all your presentations. I think we saw um, very different perspectives, some more theoretical, giving us an overview of a, um, different um, aspects and different um, actors in the process. And on the, on the other hand, we have some hands-on examples of um, yeah, um, adaptive uh, concepts and processes I have a question for Sebastian Betke, actually. Um, um, I think uh, your um, church in Uphold um, represents a very unique type of cultural heritage. And um, from your very um, 
interdisciplinary work there. Um, do you have any recommendations um, and suggestions for endangered fortified uh, churches that you um, can make to other parishes? Um, I think it's a little bit too early to say because we are actually in the middle of it, but we on a starting point. Um, the last 10 years, we were working and concentrate on, on, on maintaining, on, on, on saving these buildings, and it took as our NGO the whole effort. So this using of, of each building, we, we, we did this um, ad hoc, like um, spontaneous, and of course with some uh, uh, association programs but it was uh, for us not a question that, uh, okay, we cannot, we don't know what to use the building and then we don't uh, restoring it. So we, we start first to restoring the buildings and then uh, the, the major part. Uh, and then after now quite 10 years or more than 15 years, 10, we slowly come to the point that, okay, now the buildings are in a good shape, always has to be done something, but the maintaining costs energy and time and the buildings are not really permanently um, used so um, it's needed a concept and the concept it's not made overnight it's needed to be planned and to have time for discussion and um, uh, and development and in di dialogue so slowly we approaching to this and um, to the other parishes in this region, um, it's probably the same situation. By us, it's a special situation because the the church use as a using as a, the Protestant community using this church still. Um, but they gave us, let's say, in administration already uh, and the responsibility to a local NGO. So. There, at the moment, they have no really idea if they should do something more than uh, after the community it's lost or maybe still stays. They have no idea and a part maybe no interest. So we want to also open the door by them uh, that they get interest, uh, um, that this place um, um, uh, to reuse in other function, maybe to maintain or to keep this uh, church service every month. Um, so this is actually just a start. <laughs> it is definitely a, a very interesting um, approach. Also just um, being a, setting an example and being a model um, church for people to see what can, can be made and what can be a perspective and um, yeah, it's interesting that you say that um, in your case, um, the community is not interested anymore. But then on the other hand, um, Madeleine Gabine, Gambino uh, reported that um, even though some of these um, church buildings in Philadelphia were not in use anymore and the parishes are actually um, not existent, still the power of community um, really had an had an effect, and I, I think that's a um, something really special that came out of um, out of your research. Maybe you could um, um, tell us a bit more on um, what how did um, the parishes or the communities that are left over get active? Yeah, um, I'd be happy to, to answer that and maybe um, at the same time can address one of the questions in the chat that came up about the question in the chat is about whether this is um, uh, primarily about internal Catholic policy and weighing um, the, the value or the importance of particular um, parish communities and parish histories over another. Um, and so I'll, I'll address the chat, chat question to, to get to um, Caroline's question. Um, yes and no, um, to some degree, my research is definitely about um, the internal policy of the archdiocese. Um, and um, a lot of these decisions and particularly the decisions to close parishes um, in black neighborhoods in the late 20th century were um, framed by the archdiocese as 
absolutely nothing about race and just objective financial sense. So um, excavating that history for me is, is to be able to say, you know, no, um, this actually at the very least had significant consequences for those neighborhoods. Um, and it's, it's often much more complicated than that. Um, so in, in some degree, it's about the internal um, uh, dynamics of the church, but, um, but those internal dynamics have really strong um, effects on the, the local community. Um, and in one way this happens is that these parishes or what, what um, remain of the parishes will seek collaboration outside of the church. Um, so parishioners um, looking to local preservationists um, or to the historical commission, which is part of the city government um, to, to claim um, historic designation for the buildings to sort of slow, you know, if it's, if it's designated, then they can't demolish it. Um, or um, working with developers to try and figure out is, is there another way to use this building and to preserve some of the history. Um, neighbors who are not Catholic will also often get involved because they care what happens to these buildings, um, whether or not it's from any sort of personal connection or they just like the way that it looks in the neighborhood and, and the way it feels. Philadelphia has a very strong sense of neighborhood identity. Um, and so knocking down those, those old buildings, um, old in Philadelphia can be early 18th century, um, but, but includes late 19th century. So from the American perspective, our old is, is um, uh, uh, what Sebastian called young. Um, so it's something to keep in mind, um, but also the effects that this has on the neighborhood. So um, if churches close in certain neighborhoods in Philadelphia, that could mean that those neighborhoods no longer have access to alternative schools. Um, the public school system in Philadelphia is, is pretty bad. Um, so Catholic schools, particularly for the African-American community, have long been a, an alternative. And if those parishes and their schools close, then that, that's no longer an opportunity. Um, but also, um, churches have been sites of um, legal services or social services, daycares, um, those types of things. So again, if those disappear from neighborhoods where those aren't really, um, uh, there aren't other um, possibilities for those services, that, that really affects more than just the Catholics um, who live there. And then also what's put there instead. So for St. Laurentius, if that turns into a high-end residential development, um, that contributes to things like um, congestion, traffic congestion and parking, which is a huge deal in Philadelphia. The streets are very narrow and typically one way. Um, and also um, to gentrification and residential segregation in the city and income um, inequality, which are, are, are very um, big problems uh, in the city. Um, and, and sort of the flip side, um, these two examples, St. Laurentius and St. Peter Claver, those could be churches that are sold or properties that are sold um, to, to gain income because they're in highly desirable neighborhoods. But there are also churches that have been closed um, in low income neighborhoods where there isn't a developer sort of chomping at the bit to, to, to buy it and to flip it. So in those cases, um, the buildings can just be left crumbling or they're just demolished um, you know, with, with uh, no alternative. Um, so I think that those are really important um, external consequences um, and factors that play in these internal decisions that they can't really be separated from, from one another. Um, and just very briefly, the parishioners themselves, um, they're self-organized and self-motivated. Um, so they're gathering on Facebook. Um, they are making connections with preservationists and preservationists are making connections with them. Um, so they're getting um, people reaching out to them saying, we wanna help you save this church. Um, and using all sorts of um, uh, social media to make videos, to, to appeal to um, the archdiocese or, or anyone who might help them um, by um, really emphasizing their historic um, community value and the historic value of the churches themselves. Yeah, I think it's really, um, for me, um, I, I take away if, from this that it's always um, a very individual fight and also um, the circumstances are always so um, different um, that um, finding um, policies or um, 
you know, there is no, and there is no one way of um, finding a solution for a church, um, which is interesting since um, Anastasia's work is looking on finding um, this, um, yeah, best practice um, approach. And your your work was very graphic and um, uh, looking at general factors and trying to bring them to, yeah, bring it to the point. Um, which I think can also be helpful. Um, maybe you could um, tell us more of, um, is, is there um, some new insights, maybe from also, also from this um, symposium that you take away um, um, for your research and... Um... Yeah, um, so for me, I think um, like the most challenging fact about churches was that anyway, church is a piece of real estate so but it's really hard to to consider it as real estate so i think every time so when we start analyzing values which are based on sustain on aspects of sustainable development so it means that we have four values cultural social environmental and economic so and uh, in the majority of cases these economic values of churches they're just lost usually the um, so the people who work with churches or who just think about churches don't consider uh, such economic values. So and for me, it was kind of challenging because so on the one hand, I understand why they think so. So because church is something, um, I can say intangible or so something like higher than where we are. But on the other hand, so it's, it still has physical appearance. So it means that we th we should think even not should even we have to think about churches as about um, real estate. So and yeah, in my thesis I try to match all these factors. So I try I try to match uh, stakeholders also uh, with the values, with the partnerships, so with uh, funding uh, incentives, and uh, try to find um, a way which allow us um, uh, to match all these factors, but at the same time, uh, not being offensive to parish, to people, so to the community, also to even to architects or to economists who also think about churches. And um, yeah, I think it's still an open question how to, um, how to match this. Do you think uh, people's emotional um, connection and also, um, you know, the, the values that cannot be um, expressed in, in money maybe, um, mm -hmm. still are contributing to the actual value of the real estate? Is that an approach that people take now or is it um, something that is not really taken into account for calculating uh, monetary value? Yeah, um, I think it depends. Probably depends on the country. So uh, like in different countries, it's different. So for instance, um, I spent my visiting period uh, in Ireland, in Dublin. So, and there I saw m uh, like plenty of cases of um, adapted churches and people were fine about that uh, because first of all, they thought that it's nice that they um, succeeded in uh, preserving the building. So even if it is used for, for an office or even if it is residential, so for them, it's important to, to preserve something that has high cultural value. Uh, so in Russia, it's still a bit different, I think. So uh, I feel that for people, uh, like um, this religious value has, so it's like on the top of, of, of the values. I mean, I can understand them. So I think it's important, but sometimes I think, so for me as for an architect, um, probably cultural and architectural value is on the same level with the, with the religious one. So I think that, um, uh, like probably, um, I think it's applicable for, for all the countries so that uh, usually contemporary architecture is rooted in the religious architecture. I think in the majority of countries it's like this. So, and it means that we have to preserve buildings uh, even if we, we cannot preserve um, like the religion function itself. So that's my point of view. I think, um... This perspective on um, on Russia is something that we're still uh, missing, even though we have this wonderful international exchange now here in the symposium. 
I have another question for actually um, all of the um, podium, um, more on the process of finding your, your project and how do you approach uh, people within your research and um, how did you get um, access to um, the parishes, for example? Um, how did you approach it? Maybe also um, giving some pointers to um, young researchers who want to um, start a research on, um, on church buildings or reusing churches as well. Yeah, um, I think for me, uh, like the best way to approach people to just to, to get involved, to be involved in this topic is just to talk with them. So I think this is like the most important uh, thing. So and um, like sometimes you can have uh, different opinions. So sometimes they cannot understand you from like from, from the beginning. But more you talk, more I mean they get involved and they they understand what you're talking about. Um, about funding, uh, I can say this is the, the the most challenging question about churches. I think so. And um, still, uh, projects which involve uh, private funding, they are most successful, and so they're the easiest one. But um, I mean, if you attract private funding, in the majority of cases, you need to adapt it to something private, probably. So, um, and um, or. Mm, I think so in many of countries, uh, there are many uh, NGO, so they're always happy to, I mean, to share the project and to be involved. Um, and when I just started this project, I thought that, um, I mean, nobody is um, actually is doing that. So, and, but now in the symposium, I see that there are a lot of people and um, different ages, they're involved in this topic. And I think it's, um, it's really nice, and I really appreciate this symposium for this um, for this opportunity. Well, maybe I say a few words because I'm come from the field, so um, um, uh, I see as us as a as a as a key stakeholder in this whole process. Um, the owner who is let's say in this kind of way not really active um, in the ownership on the paper. Uh, responsibility lying by us. Um, the local community, because there was also a question in the chat, um, how are we using this place or want to be used this place uh, in a touristic way or in a local community way. Um, okay, this region, uh, um, this uh, southern Transylvanian region, it's touristic, very interesting. It's coming up, uh, not last year, but uh, uh, always uh, touristic, very interesting region. Um, and we have um, visitors, like two, three thousand visitors per year. Uh, but we didn't focus on, on a tourism, tourism concept. Um, it's a nice um, 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 side effect. And um, of course, we have to also um, working with the visitor concept and with the visitors, uh, what they need and why they're coming to us or to the church. By us, it's a difficult thing to maybe to the difference of the other um, projects what you're presenting. Um, the the builder of this heritage, or the 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 hair, or the yeah, the people who 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 built up this place over the last 800 century, just left. So they left, uh, emigrated um, to Germany, and um, and now we have just stays a very small community and in, in an institution, Protestant church. But the local community are Romanians, Hungarians and Roma. And so on many points of view, they have no, also no interest really in this. Maybe they have interest, but um, they don't know yet. So it, they, they are recognized as a, as a, as a point of, in, of a visible point in a the village. They're walking every day on, on passing by, but it's it's for them a white um, place if we not open it and make some events. So the idea is that we open the place, not just for some events and then also for permanently used for the community. Um, this is the idea and we are kind of a mediator between them. We have also our ideas. We are part of the community, of course. Uh, so this makes all 
very difficult to, to forming um, actually a heritage community around the place. Um, so, but the, to answer the question, um, we, we focused on local community and the other question from Caroline, um, uh, yes, we try to um, uh, get from all sides how much input how we can get. So uh, we speaking, of course, with the local community and the authority, the mayor, with the evangelic church, of course, but also with um, academic institution as a university um, in the chat was also mentioned that in the region are many university uh, universities uh, involved in, in projects. And um, this is what the universities doing in the field study. Um, it's very nice for us as an NGO because we can profit from this and we can take it and, and get inspirating for it. So for example, now we have um, uh, uh, um, a talk with the University of Timisoara and uh, we have a students from Timisoara who working in an architecture um, cultural heritage field and make a diploma uh, work um, thesis about uh, Uphold Church. So we collaborating with them and uh, helping, of course, uh, her in their study, but we get also um, information what we will not have any time to do it. So it's a, it's a benefit for both sides. Yeah, very cool. Um, also a very broad approach. Um, maybe um, Madeleine Gambino can also give us some insights, but um, we'll have to have a look at the um, time. Um, session six starts at 45, so. Yeah, I'll be brief. Um, I mean, um, what is perhaps most no noteworthy about my approach is that I'm conducting this dissertation research now in the time of COVID. Um, so um, I had been also just introducing myself to communities, showing up at mass, showing up at, um, you know, Bible studies to participate and, and um, trying to get involved and, um, find then who's the gatekeeper to the community, who knows other people who will get me connected to, um, to the people who care a lot about these types of questions. And that that's been much more difficult um, to do. Um, so St. Peter Clavers, I've interviewed people um, all over the phone. I haven't met any of them yet in person. So it's, um, it's definitely a difficult um, way to approach this project. And I also just very briefly want to address um, Roberto's question in the chat about whether Black Lives Matter um, will affect the archdiocese approach to these questions. And it's still up in the air again, because of COVID, um, the archdiocese like many dioceses um, have um, suspended the obligation or lifted the obligation to go to mass. And so it feels like the archdiocese is a little bit on hold and they got a new archbishop um, in February last year, um, right before the start of this. So, um, I think that there has been a move. Um, there's there's a, uh, a movement or um, uh, at least a hashtag about Black Catholic Lives Matter, um, trying to raise some of these questions. But I do think that it's really noteworthy that um, in the past 50 years or so, the archdiocese has claimed fewer Black Catholics um, than uh, over the yeah over the past fifty years, so I think it was maybe about sixty thousand um, mid twentieth century, and it's now down to about forty thousand, and that's a sharper decline than um, than the rest of the population um, in the area. So I think that that's um, uh, it'll it'll be interesting to see, but it hasn't quite sort of taken off the ground yet, um, and part of that will also be a generational difference too. I think so. Thank you. Thank you very much. I can see that. Um, COVID and the lack of personal context is, uh, context is really a hindrance to our research. Um, thank you again to all of our, our uh, grantees for your presentations. Um, it is really um, a wonderful uh, insight and um, I invite all of the participants to again to have a look at the grantees page to have an, uh, a look at all the posters and um, booklets. Thank you very much for attending and um, now start, uh, session six starts. Okay, thank you. Goodbye.